Good evening, everybody. Large crowd, huh? Uh, I'm, Sister, <laughs> I'm Sister Grace from the House of Mercy, um, located here in the inner city. Now, I know we're talking about criminalization of poverty and homelessness. And when I was thinking about this, uh, the criminalization, the first thing I could think of was when we, we, we opened up the House of Mercy in 1985. But in 1996, President Clinton uh, signed the welfare reform law, which caused a lot of problems for welfare recipients. And one, the one thing that captured me and I captured Harry and many others too was the fingerprinting of welfare recipients. Because what that meant immediately to us was welfare recipients are being treated as criminals. Who gets fingerprinted? You know, criminals get fingerprinted. That's the general notion. So uh, here they are fingerprinting welfare recipients for what is rightfully theirs, food, shelter, clothing, you know, medical insurance. And now if they have nothing and they apply for welfare, they won't be able to get on welfare unless they're fingerprinted. Which, and if they refuse to be fingerprinted, they're denied all the things that are rightfully theirs by law. So I heard about this when I was driving, uh, driving around the car and I, I thought right away, this is criminalization of the poor. And I went to the House of Mercy, drove to the House of Mercy, and started immediately the protest. So we went to the welfare office and we protested and three of our sisters were arrested. And uh, it was the first time I was arrested. So I went to trial and it took, it took the jury nine hours to decide whether or not we were guilty or not guilty. Uh, in the end, we were acquitted. Now Harry beat us too. We were guilty. Yeah. Well, the interesting yeah. was um, they, went, they went the week ahead and you put fingerprints all over the walls of the welfare department. Yeah, we, we, uh, we brought in ink pads and um, decided that if they want fingerprints, we'll give them fingerprints. And so we just kind of started putting our inky fingerprints all over the, uh, all over the waiting room in the Department of Social Services down on West Ball Road. And I, well, it was myself and two other, two other folks from St. Joseph's Hasa Hospitality, Eric McComb and Paul Tremblay. And I made, I made a real mistake because I, uh, when I do civil disobedience, I like to have a plan for what we're going to do and, and then not escalate it. You just offer whatever action you're going to offer. And if the police arrest you, fine. If not, you don't. And I, I went and kind of um, cased the joint before we were going to do it. And there were sheriff's deputies right there. So I figured, you know, with the sheriff's deputies right there, it'll be you know, 30 seconds of fingerprinting and, and we'll be in handcuffs. Um, but what I hadn't realized was that the, although it's a county facility, the Westfall Road facility is within the bounds of the city, which means that the sheriff's deputies can't arrest you, they have to call the city police. So, so we ended up actually fingerprinting the walls for a good half hour before, and, and, and you can fingerprint a lot of walls. I mean, I mean and you can fingerprint a lot of walls in half an hour, and, and, and Eric, who was uh, just, just 18 at the time, was very creative. He was putting food, food not fingerprints messages in fingerprints. Um, and, and it was one of the most wonderful times because it, it was a time of real, uh, open public discussion that like you rarely see because we were doing it right in the waiting room and so there were a lot of a lot of recipients right there and um, and they people started talking about the issue was what we were doing right was it right that they should be fingerprinted and there was a really um, it, some people started singing songs and, and it, 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 it really changed the atmosphere of the Department of Social Services. And one of my favorite things was that uh, Dick Chaucel, who was then the head of the Department of Social Services, uh, came down to see what was going on. He was really angry, of course. And, but what was really great was that the, the more experienced welfare recipients uh, recognized them and realized this was their chance to get to the commissioner of social services without all, because he's standing there in the lobby without all his guards and secretaries. 
to guard them. And so there's this line for me with people bringing him their problems directly, and he's getting more and more red in the face. But I'm sorry. No, no, go ahead. So it was a, it was a good time. But we did, uh, we did eventually get convicted, but um, it was one of the case, one of those cases where we had, or we actually, um, we actually, it, it, I'm kind of I'm pretty ashamed of this because it's the one one time in my career that I copped a plea and, and pled guilty rather than going to trial um, because they were. Um, in, they increased our charges to felony charges um, when, because when the uh, when the Department of Social Services gave the estimate of how much it would cost to repaint, all of a sudden they were deciding to use union labor and you know the most expensive, <laughs> which I'm sure they would. I'm sure that was an honest <laughs> thing on their part, and, and so it it. it it actually was pretty easy to get it up to you know felony level charges. One one of the one of the points that we were trying to do in 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 doing this action was to say to kind of contrast that you know people get so upset about fingerprinting a wall property, but not about fingerprinting human beings, and 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 just the way that in in America property is so much more sacred than human beings than persons. And, and we really found that out um, because, they, you know, they, after Sister Grace and Sister Rita and Sister Gloria got arrested, the police came and re-arrested us, charged us with a felony, increased the charge to a felony, put, and were holding us in jail without bail. And, I mean, it was really fun. You know, we were sitting in a cell, and, you know, when you're sitting in a cell with a bunch of people, you talk about your charges and all, and we were telling people what we were in for, and I remember this this one young kid who was who was in jail for beating up his uh, girlfriend, and he was only charged with a misdemeanor, you know, a minor crime. And he goes, "Man, you know, you know, I'm, I'm just, you know, you know, I'm just got a misdemeanor. You know, you guys are in trouble." And and again, you know, the amount of damage that you have to do to a person <coughs> to be charged as heavily as you get charged for doing the equivalent amount of damage to property is, you know, is, is phenomenal. I mean, the, the law protects property far more than it protects people. And w that was our point, but it, we, we proved it far more than we ever thought we were, were going to, which, which I think is one of the reasons why doing civil disobedience is important because it's a good way for us us who are have, have the privileges of being white and middle class to begin to experience what folks of color and folks who are poor experience at at the hands of the criminal justice system I mean we we, we always get treated with kid gloves in comparison but even that you know is scary <coughs> Well, we were uh, when we were arrested. Um, most I think it was Jack Doyle, who was the county executive at that time, didn't like us because we would be going to the county legislature every month when they have the public forum, and we would talk to the legislators about how they are treating the poor, how wrong how wrong they are in the way they are treating the poor, and Jack Doyle, being the county executive at that time, didn't like the fact that we were doing this. So when we went to <coughs> when we went to welfare and protested, he was already angry with us. So that was why we got immediately arrested. Um, and it was quite interesting because we went in the jail. People, we knew the people in the jail because they were peop our people, our clients that we always take care of. And we would go to uh, court and, and visit, and even in jails and visit them. And they were shouting out to the, to the police, let them go, let them go. They didn't want us arrested. Um, of course, they didn't let us go. Uh, but then when we came back, after being arrested, when we came back to the House of Mercy, it was very interesting that our people came up to us and said, thank you for fighting for us. Uh, we had said to the people that joined us for, at the, uh, at the <coughs> welfare office, we said, look, if you have a felony, if you have a charge, you know, if you don't want to be arrested, when the police say, okay, leave or you'll be arrested, leave. And so they were protesting with us. Uh, but when the police came and said that, they, they did leave. 
and that's why only sisters, the three sisters, were were arrested because you know we didn't have any charges against us. Uh, but it was interesting that that meant so much to them because they said you're fighting for us, and they knew that if they had gone, that it would have been harder on them rather than on us. Uh, but we brought a trial purposely to bring the issues the issue out. And it really bothered me that welfare recipients were being fingerprinted. It, and it still bothers me uh, that that happened. It's extremely disturbing and for me it's heartbreaking too because we see so much of this for little little things that our people do that are constantly being arrested. You know, arrest the poor seems to be the message that the police are getting when it comes to people in the inner city. So there's also, in thinking about the criminalization, I was thinking of the after hours program that welfare has. Are you familiar with the after hours no. program? Well, if a person is homeless, they can call after call the welfare office after five o'clock and they should be placed in a shelter or a hotel or where they should be placed. But if they have gone to welfare and they didn't follow one of them up on one of the mandates that they were told to, to follow. Uh, Welfare would refuse to house them, and that happens all the time, and it happens to people who are homeless, and it really bothers us because if welfare isn't going to find a place for them, then they have to go out and find something themselves, but we feel it's welfare's responsibility. Uh, so if welfare refuses to help a homeless person after hours, that means that after 5 o'clock, that person is still out in the street, no place to live, uh, no food, no shelter, no medical insurance, uh, destitute. And it's, it's, it's happened so much that it seems like, you know, welfare just doesn't care. They so blatantly are always saying, no, we can't help you, or, you know, we can't help you because you've been sanctioned. And that could easily lead desperate people to commit crimes or to do something to, you know, get themselves arrested, not purposely, but they're going to do something rather than stay out in the streets and it could lead to arrest, and then uh, they do something, they're arrested, and then they're, um, they're criminalized after that. You know, so that's a program. <clears throat> There's also the open bottle container. Uh, it, we have people on the street with open bottle container. Okay, so they're arrested by a police officer. They go to jail, and I can't help but contrast that to, to people in government, the corruption, the fraud that goes on in government, which is worse than an open bottle container, but our people go to prison for a jail for little, you know, uh, what you would call maybe little crimes that may be aren't even crimes, but they languish in jail or they languish in prison, uh, and many of them are wrongfully arrested, but they're arrested so easily. <clears throat> my own staff person, CW, he was driving my car in a rondequoit. And he was stopped by a police officer because he was black. And the police officer checked the license of the car he was driving, and of course that's Sisters of Mercy. And so he became very suspicious of CW who was driving my car. And he stopped CW. But if he had not been black, he would not have stopped CW. And if they had not called me, CW might have ended in, up in jail too. You know, so it's uh, besides racism, the racism and and the uh, classism and uh, the criminalization, and that it all goes together. There was a now we also are aware of our people, many of them walking down the street, minding their own business. They're black, go down the street, and the police comes up, officer comes up to them and arrests them, and they're wondering why they're being arrested. They committed no crime. They're innocent, but they is it mistaken identity? Do they look suspicious? Uh, and this happens quite frequently. Um, and, th you know, th the question for our people is why are the police picking on us? Because we're in the inner city, uh, we're black, and does that make us criminals? Sometimes you wonder. Uh, and then we come to the Civic Center garage, and you know, all, you know that, you, I think you all know the history of this, that the, the uh, people, have, homeless have been in the Civic Center garage for years. And then suddenly some women became, didn't like the image of the homeless in the Civic Center garage and began to complain. And these are the secretaries and people that work for the judges who use the garage. Okay, so they said last year, um, about a year and a half ago, they said they were going to close the garage to the homeless in November. Of course, that's the beginning of winter. So we said, don't do this until we find a place for the homeless, a building. So they didn't close it in November, 
and then they tried again in um, January, Martin Luther King's birthday. They stopped it then. Then they were going to do it in April. Well, we thought, since we were working, we thought maybe the colony was working with us, and we met with the LDC board and asked them to hold off closing the garage until we found a building. Well, then, just as August 20th, we got word that they were closing the garage, and they did close it on August, August 20th. Now, this means that all the homeless that were in, about 30 plus, were on the streets, and all, they're dispersed all over the city, all over the county. And we called for a meeting with the uh, county, and uh, there was on a Tuesday, and the Thursday before, we were all set to go, the Thursday before, we get a call from Kelly Reed, the Commissioner of Human Services, saying the meeting is called off. And well, but why is the meeting called off? I said, we need to discuss this because if we find a building, you're going to, the county's going to have to help us pay for a building because we don't have that kind of money. And we also need money for services, provide the services that the homeless need. Uh, so we were trying to get her to keep the meeting and she wouldn't do it. So then we protested at the county building knowing that the one who's calling the shots is Maggie Brooks. So we went to the county and um, we were protesting there, and three of us got arrested because we wouldn't leave when they told us to leave. Uh, and the interesting thing, when I was when I was arrested and brought into the jail, there were some of our clients that were in jail, and they were people with mental problems. And um, I thought this is not the place for them, but this happens with our people who are mentally ill, the first thing they do if they're causing trouble is put them in jail. And we know that many of the um, homeless have mental issues. And what the county is saying is that they are satisfied with the work that they are doing because they have their workers going out and putting homeless people in, um, in housing first, in hotels. And what we're saying, yes, you are helping some of them, but there is a contingent of about 30 plus that are still out there with mental issues that need to be helped. And they're saying, well, if they don't want our help, then let them be. And we know this is wrong. This is very wrong. And so we're trying to, we're trying to work with them, but it seems like our pleas are falling on deaf ears. Uh, so we have a big job to do, and we need a lot of, of uh, support from the community to help us win this issue of getting a place for the homeless. You see all the buildings that are going on, new buildings, all the money they have spent, and the city, you see all the new, and the lofts that are being built and costing thousands of dollars, and they can't find one building for the homeless in the city. And then we run into the zoning laws of the city. Uh, and as far as we're concerned, center city means not in our back, not in my backyard. So that the laws of the city prevent the homeless from even living there and also work against us trying to find a place for them in the city. We have found buildings, but we've been sabotaged. We found one building right in the city would have been a perfect spot for the homeless, and we discovered later that someone from the city went to the owner of the building and said, don't give it to us. Uh, so, and we found another building we thought was would have been quite good and was in the city. And uh, we went to look at it, and the, the, the um, agent said to me, well, how much time do you need? We said two weeks, because we had one group going to check it out on one Wednesday, and the following Wednesday, another group was going to check it out. And uh, by the time we got to the second group, before the second group got to go out and see the building, it was gone. We no longer have it. So there are forces that are, that are really working against us to prevent us from, from getting this build, the buildings. But we're not going to give up on it. Um, we'll continue working on it. There's a contingent. Some of the people that left the garage or forced out of the garage were living um, out near the um, near the uh, ex expressway, Max and Broadway. There is a, an encampment there, and we heard just recently that they the police went there and put them all out, and they were outside, and moved them. They they had to leave that area. So it seems like wherever they go now to find refuge, they still are being put out. Um, and um, one, one man that came to the House of Mercy recently, a homeless man, said he went to Blossom South, you know, the building on, on Monroe, mm -hmm. and he found an unlocked door. So he went in and he was comfortable there because it was warm. He said they have a big kitchen 
and I think he was, you know, feeling pretty good about it. At least he was out of the elements. And one day he happened to go out the wrong door, and the alarm went off, and they arrested him. So it seems like there's, you know, they're after the homeless wherever they are. And it's a very bad, um, I think it's a bad omen for all of us. Now, um, if you stop and think of what's been happening historically, the homeless used to go to the subway. Now that's been closed to them, right? Mm -hmm. uh, there were homeless, there was an encampment along the outside the Amtrak Railroad. Yeah. Okay, they came to watch them, put them away, you know, order them out. But we found a place for them, which was really good. But still, the point is, they were out there. They've been there for about nine, 13, I don't know, nine, 13 years, and they were put out. Um, now they go to the Civic Center garage. They're put out. Uh, the man in the at Blossom South put out, and the people that are alongside the expressway, when they find out they're there, they're put out. What is going on in our city and our county? And you know we can't just stand by and say, well, so we have to do something about it. And it really is bothersome to us because the weather is getting cold, and um, like tonight. You know, and where are they? The night that the garage was closed, we were at the garage. They let us in to protest, but they would not let the homeless in. So we stayed there for a while, and when, we, when I left about 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock at night when I left the garage, I found one of the homeless men that had been in the garage sleeping on a bench right in front of the county building. And then I got a call from one of the homeless men that I had been seeing in the garage, and he said that they put us out of the garage and we have no place to go. And when I found him, he told me where he was, it was at Washington Square Park, and I found three other men there, and they were all hungry, got them something to eat, and they said they wanted to go to a shelter downtown. I brought them to the shelter, and they were refused. And this, for me, harkens back 30 years ago, the reason why I opened up the House of Mercy was because homeless were not homeless people were not accepted in homeless shelters, and that issue is still here, is still around. Uh, Gary Smith, who's a who's a Jesuit priest, writes in this book Radical Compassion. He says, and I agree with this. He says we live in a culture that has declared war on the homeless poor. A war in which our cities try to regulate beggars and edge poor people out of existence. And I thought how true these words are. That's exactly what is happening, edging them out of existence, out of sight, out of mind. Because today it's a crime to be poor and homeless. Uh, and it's a horrible thing. And I'm sad to say that, and angry that our city and county leaders, it seems like they have joined this war. The same author tells a story of a homeless man he knew. His name was Eddie. And he had a traumatic life living with his aunt. Uh, she would punish him for every little thing he did and punish him and embarrass him. And finally, he got older. He finally left his aunt and became homeless. And when Eddie was writing his story, the haunting words that he used, and this is a statement he made, it's sometimes cold outside, but not as cold as people. That rings, that rings true. Uh, and what I want, I want to read, this is an article, I just want to read part of it to you. It's more cities add laws that target the homeless. And this is July 2014. What, which paper? It's from the DNC. Yeah, did you see the article? I don't know if it is. Yeah, if you want a copy, I'll give you one. But, okay, it says, more cities are making it illegal to camp in public, sleep in vehicles on city streets, or sit or lie down in public, a new report shows. The laws are meant to curb the problems associated with homelessness, such as public drunkenness and sleeping on the sidewalk. But the report released Wednesday by the National Law Center on Homelessness and Poverty says the, says the laws criminalize people just for being homeless. And this is what we're seeing. Uh, the, uh, the
the executive director of the center says, there has been a striking increase in city laws prohibiting camping in parks, on sidewalks, or in any public space. In 2014, 64 communities had citywide bans on public camp camping, up from 40 in 2011. The number of cities that prohibit sleeping in vehicles jumped from 37 in 2011 to 81 in 2014. The number that prohibits sitting or lying in public spaces increased from 70 in 2011 to 100 in 2014. So now they have what they call the, the sit slash lie laws that bar sitting or lying down on any street sidewalk, entrance to a store, alley, or other public space. And then it says what cities, and we see this happening in Rochester, a downtown, they are revitalizing their urban neighborhoods, which often means expensive housing and zoning laws. And this is a quote. They have, they have an interest in having poor people and not having poor people be very visible. This is what we're experiencing. Um, you know, I think we all need to do something to stop this. And you know the way I feel about it is the poor and homeless are not criminals. The real criminals are our leaders and city and county leaders who criminalize, who criminalize the poor. They are the criminals, not our people, who are only trying to survive. And so we have a real issue here in Rochester, and we need people to help us fight the issue. Uh, we need to find a building, we need money for this. The county should give us a building, but they're not working with us. Um, and we need to find it soon so that we can take care of our homeless. We may have to do something temporary now, but we, the ultimate goal is to find a place and fight the, the authorities that are fighting us so that we can have this, have this building. And stop the criminalization of homeless and poor in our city. Yes. When you told them that you were going to look for a building, were they receptive to they were going to help at all? Well, we met with the city, um, and we said we found a building, and it was it was in Center City. And what we were told by the city was, if you want this building, we're not going to help you fight the zoning laws. You have to fight those laws yourself. If you fight the laws and you win, then we'll help you. But that's not helping us because we need we need the zoning laws changed. Um, we are, you know, we're thinking of things we can do like lawsuits or something like that. Uh, but that's down the road. Right now, we need something immediate. And I don't know what we can do to change the hearts and minds of the authorities. So, I, what are the zoning laws that are so restricting? you and your folks finding a decent building. I don't there, understand there are, this. There, I know. There are buildings in the city, yeah. especially in the center city, that are zoned so that they're saying no poor, no homeless can live in this dwelling. You know? Yeah, the city, the city code specifically bars several activities from the center city. Um, one is sex shops. Another is um, pawn shops, and a third is homeless shelters. So it's not even, it's not even just the zoning laws, it's the, the actual city code bans homeless shelters within the center, center city district, which is where, where it's needed. Yeah, that's where Because that's, that's where the majority of folks congregate and, and often are, are afraid to walk too much farther out into other areas or you know just aren't able to get there so so it's actually uh, we actually need the city council to uh, to amend the city code and uh, and we when Grace and I and a number of other folks met with mayor Warren last last week mm -hmm. um, I asked her specifically, well, will you try to amend the city code? And she said, no. I'm always reason? interested in reasons. Yeah. What are the reasons why she said no? 
Well, her reason was that there would still be other zoning laws to deal with and that therefore it wouldn't do any good, was what, what she told us. But it, it was, you know, I, I spent a number of years in Syracuse and Syracuse faced a similar problem back in 1979 when uh, a place called Unity Kitchen, which was kind of the largest shelter, closed its doors. And basically it took a, it took a couple of months, but the, the leaders of the county, the county executive, the leader of the, uh, and the commissioner of social services got together with Catholic charities there. And within the space of four or five months, they got a building, a place called the Oxford Inn, which was a shelter. Uh, it was just for men, but it took every any man who came to the door. Um, they, it was in existence until last year, and then they moved to a new, uh, a new facility with a different name. But they're still still operating. They they have uh, they sleep about 130 men a night. Um, and it was purely the fact, you know, purely faced with a similar situation. The leaders of Onondaga County and Syracuse had the will to do it, and they did it. it took a few months. There were a few months when people were out, out on the streets, literally the way they are now in Rochester. But within a few months, they they had at least a bare bones shelter going, and it's it's grown over the over the years. I, I worked the first night. There were only four people there the first night, but within within a month or so, we, were, we had 60 to 80 people sleeping, and now it's up, up to 130. Um, it, from my perspective, it's purely a matter of will. It's Love and Warren doesn't have the will or desire to help, yeah. and certainly Maggie Brooks doesn't have the will or desire to help. And that that is that's the bottom line. They don't. Uh, they don't want to put the money into it. They don't, and it's not a they don't really care. Yeah, it's not a priority. You know, years ago, I, I've been working in a city for years, and years ago, I heard that the city has a plan to move all the poor out of the city because they want to. Um, they want to vitalize the city, which is what they're doing now. Because the poor are being moved out, and. The, and to move them into not the suburbs, but exurbia, uh, further out, so that they are invisible, so they're not seen. And th this was talked about years ago, and now today it's happening. Because you can see how, how they're, they're moving closer and closer from the city side of the city, they're building the city up. You see what's happening in the city. And uh, they don't want the homeless there. They don't want the poor there. And even some streets like Monroe or Park Avenue, if you go up to those streets now, uh, they were filled with black people before, poor black. Now it's not so heavily that way. It, it's changing, and it's done purposely to move the poor out of the city. This plan, this plan was generated years ago, and now it's taking fruition, and we're seeing the results of it. But the idea is to make the poor invisible, and that is their plan. You can see houses coming down all over the city. Um, what, you know, that's part of gentrification. They're, they're going to clean up the city and they're bringing the suburbanites back into the city. Uh, you can see what's happening there. Uh, they do not want the poor visible. I'm just curious. Pardon me? I'm just curious if you have any thoughts or words to share with students in social work or people, new social workers, um, any words of encouragement about like pushing against like sort of business as usual, like the sanction system or how things are done in City Hall and the county, like? Yeah, well, you know, we meet every week, every week on these issues. And I think for college students to come to our meetings and join us, uh, they would get a perfect idea as to what they can do to change the system. Uh, Brockport students are coming to our meetings and to keep the issue of the homeless alive and keep it out there in the public, one is they're, they're collecting blankets and tons of blankets 
uh, so we can use them for the poor. If we are building for the homeless, and we can use them if we have the building. But the idea <coughs> is to keep the publicity out there. So anything students can do to put the publicity out there would be great. Uh, it's like your class yesterday. Yeah. Uh, go ahead. Do you want to? Yeah, they were talking. Say a little bit about Monday and the plans for the tent city on Monday. Well, one thing we're thinking, and the students can help us here, and the blankets are part of it. Uh, Monday at four o'clock, we're going to meet at uh, the Washington Square Park, and uh, we're going to put up tents uh, for the homeless. We may get arrested again. Uh, but there's something will be risky uh, just to get the issue out there that the homeless have to be taken care of immediately. Uh, we, you know, at the House of Mercy, uh, we need to expand. What we're thinking of is if by mid-November we can have trailers, we have to tear down a building and do some work, but if we have some land, we can put trailers there and we can shuttle people, you know, back and forth. Uh, at least they'll have a place for the winter time until a building is found. Um, now, Monday, we want to get publicity on the fact that the homeless are out, out there in the cold. So anything students can do to help us, like bringing blankets. Uh, in Harry's class the other day, they were talking about sign, getting petition signed and taking them to Maggie Brooks and to the city and saying, this is a horrible problem. You must do something about it. And the more signatures we get, you know, the better it would be. Um, and I think that as we talk to students, if we have a chance to talk to students, they come up with their own ideas of what they could do to help us. Uh, but it's, we, the students that come to us from Brockport uh, and come to our meetings are really enthused and they really want to get involved in this issue. And they're the ones that came up with the idea of the, the blankets, but they also keep coming back to our meetings because uh, they were there when we were arrested. When we spoke to the, outs, outs, the city board, they were there. Um, any kind of action we have, they want to be a part of. And one student from Brockport, uh, she was upset the day we were arrested. She was upset that she wasn't there because she wanted to be arrested. She wanted to you know, put, her, put her body on the line and say, look, you know, this is wrong. Um, so the more they can join us in our effort and come to our meetings, they'll get many more ideas about what they can do. Like going to Harry's class, the idea of um, of the um, of, of signing petitions, that was a student's idea. The other idea that came up was um, uh, a TV was uh, well. Um, what program was that? <coughs> what remember he said that? What y, YNN? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. One, one of my students. Has yeah. Well, he said that he, he has a relative that works for YNN in. Where was it? Syracuse. Syracuse. And he said he wants me to contact, he's going to talk to his uncle, and he says he wants to get this, the, this news out in, out in the county of Syracuse so that they'll know what's happening here. And what is your name again, hon? Sandy. Yeah, you, you said you think they're homeless where you are, and you want something to happen there. Uh, so I think the more that people are aware of this, the more they become involved in it, I think. Uh, I think would be a great thing because the homeless issue is all over the nation. It's all over. I know it's in these counties. Uh, we need people to join us to make sure that the word is out and we can work together to make this make this building happen. We need people who will write letters uh, even to uh, Maggie Brooks and to the mayor. You know, if if students can do that, or even if students will push for meetings with them and see what would happen. You know, the students at the colleges, you know, say, I want to meet with the mayor on this issue or with the, with the county exec. I think that would be good. Uh, we need to put pressure on the city and the county, county to work with us, not against us. I don't know if that helps you. Um, do you yeah, yeah, did you have any ideas? <laughs> uh, shut it down? I don't know. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Right, right, right. The whole thing, I don't know. Yeah. yeah. Well, one thing. You know, oh, what? I, I think it's also important to realize that this the criminalization of poverty and homelessness is not is nothing new. Um, you know, since since the days of the colonies, we've had the law of vagrancy, 
okay? Which, and vagrancy laws are enacted by each state, but essentially vagrancy makes it a crime to be poor, a stranger, and without visible means of support. Poor, a stranger, and without visible means of support. Uh, designed to allow uh, police to arrest tramps. I, I, I find it interesting, of course, because if you're rich, a stranger, and without visible means of support, then you're a tourist, which is just fine. The only difference, the only difference between a tourist and a vagrant is <clears throat> whether you're poor or not. And, and the the law of vagrancy um, actually was inherited from England. It was part uh, in the wake of the plague, the Black Death, um, which wiped out somewhere between 25 and 50 percent of the population, um, meaning which radically decreased the, the labor force. Um, the employers were faced with a really terrible crisis because the, the, supply, the labor supply had gone way down. And of course, do you guys know the basic economic law of supply and demand, the, the wonderful law of capitalism. If, if the supply of something goes down and the demand is the same, what should happen to the price? According to the law of supply, supply and demand. If you have less supply, less stuff there, what's going to happen to the price? Of that? It's going to go up. According to the sacred law of supply and demand. So if you think about the labor situation in, in the wake of the Black Death, <coughs> the, la the supply of labor went down. What should have happened to the price of labor, meaning wages? It should have gone up. And of course, all, all the good-hearted good businessmen said, well, that's just the law of capitalism, so we'll we'll just have to pay them higher wages. No, right? they didn't, Harry. No, they didn't. That's right. What did they do? They went to the government and called for government interference, and the government passed what was called the Statute of Laborers, which says, if you don't have a job, if you, Ted, do not have a job, and I offer you a job at any wage whatsoever, and you refuse that job, then you can be arrested as a vagrant. Pretty nifty way to get around the law of supply and demand, right? Um, and, and you know we've inherited this tradition where uh, now the, the laws of vagrancy were actually declared unconstitutionally vague uh, in 1972 by the U.S. Supreme Court in a case called Papa Christou versus Jacksonville, but. As late as the 1980s, um, states like Nevada were still enforcing their vagrancy laws. And a lot of the kind of law, the laws that Sister Grace was talking about, these new laws against public sleeping and all, these are being, these are being experimented with and used because states don't have the old law of vagrancy anymore to fall back on. So I, I just wanted to put that in Yeah, that's good, context. that's good. Um, I see the professor coming up and you. <laughs> uh, uh, sorry, sorry. No, uh, it was wonderful. Sorry. sorry. And, and the, other, the other thing that really impressed me about the, from my own personal experience about the criminalization of poverty um, it, it is the jails. That in particular, jails in the United States are designed to control what, what some folks have called the rabble, the poor. They're not designed to control, to, to deal with serious crime. The vast majority of people who are in jail today are in jail because they're poor. Um, something like half of the people in jail nationally um, are there because they can't afford bail. Okay, um, and, and what really struck me was the, the first time that I actually went to jail was <clears throat> was in Albany County Jail 
back in the mid-1980s, I, I was arrested for protesting um, aid to the Contras, Ronald Reagan's favorite terrorists in, in Nicaragua. And um, I, was, I was convicted, as, as usual. I, the, the judge was great. I, uh, I, I gave my usual defense, and the judge goes to me, you argue better than most lawyers I know. <laughs> Guilty, 15 days. Uh, and he gave me a choice between 15 days and paying a $200 fine. And I, I, chose, I chose to take the 15 days rather than pay the fine. And at the time, I was teaching at uh, Union College in Schenectady. And um, my fellow professors, especially the, cons the conservative political science professors, were just you know, appalled. First of all, they couldn't conceive of a Union College professor being in jail, and, and they thought I was an utter lunatic <laughs> to go to jail out. rather We're than pay the fine. <laughs> but, but, you know, when you're sitting in jail in the cell and you're talking with people, um, you know, you talk about your your case, and I told, I told them, you know, I had a choice between 15 days and a $200 fine, and and to a man, because we were only allowed to see men, uh, or be with men, to a man they said, yeah, $200, two weeks. Yeah, that sounds like a rational decision. That's what I do. <laughs> In other words, the people who were there, for the people who were there, for, for my, my class, you know, professors, it was total insanity to go to jail for two weeks rather than cop up $200. But for the for the people who were in jail, that was a rational decision. Two weeks in jail <clears throat> was worth the price of not giving up $200, because you didn't have it. And, and more than anything else, that, you know, that, that struck me, how our criminal justice system is designed to deal with the poor. Now, can I, should I get into what I was gonna talk about? Do you want to segue into Th that, This could segue yeah. a little bit. Yeah. What I'm gonna talk about is, is may will seem kind of peripheral at first, although Sandy knows. Um, it, it, it's it's sort of a it's really a, sort of a through the looking glass down the rabbit hole, Alice in Wonderland experience, or it has been um, for us, in which large numbers of white, mostly middle, mostly white, mostly middle class or working class anti-war protesters. Um, had discovered something about the workings of the American criminal justice system which took us by surprise, even though many of us have been involved uh, in Catholic worker houses, been involved in advocacy uh, and, and protest against the criminal justice system, and have done jail time. Um, over, over 50 people at this point, um, overwhelmingly white, um, has been uh, one African-American man from uh, from Ithaca, James Ricks, who you really ought to get James to come, come to the squirrel sometime. He's, he, he's, he, he is such an impressive guy, and, and the way, and he's developed into such an incredible speaker, um, have been issued orders of protection. Um, design, and I, So I've, got, I've got some copies of this here. People, people want these. This is, these are my yeah. These are my orders of protection. Oh, we can just pass them around. I've got two of them because I, I I've gotten issued, got them twice. So um, if you want if you want to take a look at it. Um, are these the same? Um, well. No, one, one, one is dated uh, the year before the other. The, the first one is, I think I've got them in order. The, um, the first one was, well, only went to, to May uh, of 2014, and now I've got, and this, this, so this one's out of date now, and this, they decided I was so dangerous that they couldn't, <laughs> that, that a, a year of protection from me was not enough. So they had to, when, when this one, first one expired, they had to give another one um, for, what they're, for what they're worth. Um, it, 
and well, let me just say that we've stumbled into a rabbit hole um, as we found out what happened. This, um, maybe I'll, I'll just read some of it here. This is a temporary order of protection against me. Um, where it is hereby ordered that the above-named defendant, Harry W. Murray, uh, observe the following conditions of behavior. Stay away from Greg Zemmel, the home of Greg Zemmel, the school of Greg A. Zemmel, the business of Greg A. Zemmel, the place of employment of Greg A. Zemmel, refrain from communication or any other contact by mail, telephone, email, voicemail, or other electronic or any other means with Greg A. Zemmel, refrain from assault, stalking, harassment, aggravated harassment, menacing, reckless endangerment, strangulation, criminal obstruction of breathing or circulation, disorderly conduct, criminal mischief, sexual abuse, sexual misconduct, forcible touching, intimidation, threats, or any criminal offense or interference with the victim or victims of or designated witnesses to the alleged offense and such members of the family or household of such victims or witnesses as shall be specifically named Greg A. Zemmel. Um, uh, what is Greg A. Uh, Greg, Greg A. Colonel Greg A. Zemmel is the commander of Hancock Air National Guard Base, the 174th Attack Wing uh, in Syracuse, New York. Um, it's, it's an Air National Guard Base, the 174th Attack Wing, um, pilots, MQ-9 Reaper drones uh, armed with Hellfire missiles and 500-pound bombs, um, which we believe they are flying in Afghanistan and at this point probably in Iraq and Syria, um, and which means that people, people on the ground in Syracuse are killing people every day in Afghanistan. Um, the, the Reaper drones don't actually fly out of Hancock. These are the remote controlled, or RPAs as the military likes to call it, remotely piloted aircraft. Um, they're flying in Afghanistan, um, but the person who's directing them, who's piloting them, and the person who pushes the button that kills that releases the Hellfire missiles that kill people are sitting right right in Syracuse, which is it's an interesting thing because it uh, uh, under international law that turns Syracuse and in effect upstate New York into a war zone because you have armed combat armed uniformed combatants, which means that if if let's say um, if if someone from the Taliban, a suicide bomber, would come to Syracuse, and if, let's say, one of the pilot and it's from the from the base were uh, at their son's or daughter's soccer game in uniform, and that suicide bomber blew up, exploded themselves, that would not be an act of terrorism under international law because they would be targeting an armed combatant in a war, which means that Syracuse is a war zone. We have, we're killing people in Syracuse. So that, that's, that's not quite what, and what, what my major point is, but that, that I think is, is one of the big issues. And, and the drones are killing innocent people. Um, a, a Hellfire missile is not a precision weapon. And they talk about it as being a precision weapon, but a Hellfire missile has a blast radius of about 30 feet, which means if they were targeting me, you all gone. You know, it's it, it's not designed as a precision weapon um, for for what it's worth. So so we and, and we can get into all kinds of issues, but essentially we are. The Drone Control Center began in 2009. Um, pretty quickly, we formed uh, what's come to be known as the 
upstate uh, drum action coalition, um, it, which is really one of the most exciting things in in the peace movement that I've seen, we, because we've we've established relationships between peace activists in Syracuse, Rochester, Buffalo, Buffalo, Albany, Binghamton, um, and a number of other smaller towns, and we we meet together regularly. And so when something when there are demonstrations, it's from people all over upstate New York, and even some downstaters have been have been joining in. Um, we've started we started a campaign of nonviolent civil disobedience there um, on April twenty second, two thousand and eleven. Um, Thirty eight of us were arrested for nonviolent action. We did a we did a die in um, covered with uh, covered ourselves with sheets with red paint on it and lie down, lay down in front of the uh, in front of the main gates to Hancock Air National Guard Base. Um, we're all arrested. We had a, a legal rally beforehand which at which several hundred people were at and, and one of the things that really struck me about that day is you, you know how a lot of times you go to rallies and the speakers are all gung ho and then you know, other people go out and do the civil disobedience. Well, all the speakers got arrested. I mean, and there were some pretty impressive people. Kathy Kelly, um, the founder of Voices in the Wilderness. Um, Martha Hennessy, who's the granddaughter of Dorothy Day, the founder of the Catholic Worker Movement. Um, Colonel Ann Wright, who resigned her position in protest of the US attack on Iraq. Brian Terrell. Um, Jerry Berrigan, who was 90 at the time, uh, he, he was in his wheelchair, so he couldn't actually lie. He had to do the dying sitting in his wheelchair. Um, and we had a week-long trial before Judge David Gideon. Um, they, they allowed an international law defense, and, and former Attorney General Ramsey Clark came and testified. Um, but we were we were all convicted. Um, a few people did jail time. Um, the judge was more lenient with me because he said he was concerned about my my students. Um, so, and I should note, David Gideon is one, one of the judges who been <coughs> issuing these orders of protection. Just yesterday, the Syracuse uh, paper had he David Gideon was awarded. Um, Magistrate of the Year for New York State, um, a, a special, a special award, and his his smiling face was there. So I've, I've been thinking about whether I, whether I should write him a letter of congratulation or not. Um, but but anyway, okay. The next year, the very, the very next year, April twenty second, which is Earth Day. Um, 33 of us were arrested, and this was what, what I call the road to Hancock, because we were actually marching. It, this one was where it started to get really bizarre. We were walking along East Malloy Road um, to the base. As soon as we crossed the town line into the town of DeWitt, the police arrested us. Basically, um, there were a few people who were planning on doing civil disobedience at the base, but we never got there. The police pulled us off in, into this parking lot, um, about 50 people, and uh, most of whom were not planning to get arrested. And they, they said, um, you know, you're all going to be arrested for parading without a permit. Um, we, we, we talked about it, and uh, the police said that if there's two people walking together, that could be a parade. Um, just, just to let you know what your rights are in this country. Um, and, and then they threatened that if anybody tried to leave, some people wanted to go back because they didn't want to be arrested. They hadn't been intending to be arrested. I had a student from Nazareth with me who, was, who really wanted to get out of there. And the police said, well, if you try to leave, then, then you will be charged with resisting arrest. Uh, another charge as well. And eventually we negotiated that people could could leave if they left their signs and all their equipment there and, and go away. And then they said, if you want to get arrested, just come over and over to where the police cars are. And so at that point, I hadn't been intending to get arrested. But a number of people were arrested who hadn't been intending to. Um, and, and so I just decided I had to. So um, I was standing with, with another woman. and. 
and, and other people were being arrested and we were standing right by the police cars, but they didn't do anything. So we finally walked over to a policeman and said, what do you got to do to get arrested around here? And then he goes, oh, oh you want to get arrested? Okay. And he pulled out handcuffs and, and cuffed us. But, but then that one was so bogus that the, the Onondaga County District Attorney's Office gave up on the case, turned it over to the town of DeWitt um, private attorney who then dropped all the charges. So we didn't, didn't have any convictions there. And at that point, they kind of decided to do what's known as a, a Gandhian wave, to have smaller demonstrations, but have them pretty regularly there. And, and so in August, there was a small action with about half a dozen people uh, again blocking the gate and, and being arrested. Uh, in October, there was the Hancock 17 uh, blocking the gates. Again, this time they tried to block all three gates. And this was the first time that they issued orders of protection. Um, Ash Wednesday of 2013, about seven people were arrested. Again, issued orders of protection. In April of 2013, the Hancock 31, including myself and Sandy, all, we all got orders of protection as well as um, charged, being charged with obstruction of governmental administration, a misdemeanor, and two counts of disorderly conduct. Uh, December 9th, 2013, Mark Coville and two uh, Yale Divinity School students um, were arrested, um, given an obstruction of governmental administration, two disorderly conducts, trespass, and orders of protection. Um, and finally, last July, um, members of the Atlantic life community, including Liz McAllister, and Claire Brady, and Felton Davis, several people from the New York City Catholic worker, Martha Hennessy again, uh, were arrested. So there's been, a, there's been this series of demonstrations with civil resistance and, and arrests. And what it has done is to, I think, overwhelm the DeWitt Town Court. The DeWitt Town Court is a small town court. It, it has two judges, um, David Gideon and Robert Jokel, both of whom are part-time. They, you know, they have full-time jobs, and, and so it's a night court. And they, they're used to handling shoplifting and DWI, and they, and, and the court system, it, of course, is also used to um, people who are charged with crimes, uh, accepting plea bargains and, and accepting deals. Um, I mean, if 90% of the people charged with crimes did not accept plea bargains, the whole system would collapse. If the criminal justice system couldn't be, if even half the people who were charged with crimes demanded a trial, the whole American criminal justice system would collapse. It couldn't begin to deal with actually giving a fair trial to everybody who gets charged. They don't have enough judges, they don't have enough courtrooms, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So we, we have been really causing difficulties. The DeWitt Town Council, I, a few weeks ago, the, the president of the DeWitt Town Council was kind of pleading with me, can't you guys just go away, stop, we can't afford all, you know, we can't afford this. And, and what we've been doing is when they charge us with misdemeanors, we are entitled to a jury trial. And so many of us have been insisting on jury trials and, and those trials have been, you know, are, are very expensive. The judges have to take time off their day jobs because you can't do a jury trial at night. And, and we've had, we have at least one jury trial a month for uh, up through June 10th, which is my, when my trial was going to be, um, and, and they haven't been able to schedule any more after that. Um, and if I'm getting confusing, ask questions or things, because it's, it, I, it's, everything is, it, it, it's complicated. There have been so many arrests, so many trials. Um, the- why are, why are you insisting on a jury trial? Why? Um, Number one, number one, we're insisting on a trial because we want 
on a trial because we want to bring the drone, the issue of the drones and international law into court and to be able to present that. And uh, we want a jury trial so that we can um, present that case to a jury of our peers. Um, it's just a small number of people, but uh, you know, you, you cannot rely on the corporate media. We, we can rely on indie media to, to present this, but um, it's, it gives you a chance to talk not only to the six members of the jury, but to the 50 or 60 people who are brought in as the jury pool uh, in, in what's known as voir dire. Um, you get a chance to talk to the jury, the, ju the whole jury pool, about who you are, why you did what you did, with, and, and there you can, the rules about what you can say are not as strict as in court. So it's really, in some ways, in the jury selection that you get your best chance to spread the word to people, and then, you know, hopefully they can spread the word to their families and friends, etc. So I mean, I mean that's that's a big piece of it. Um, we and not everybody can do that. People are in different situations. Some people do need, you know, have taken plea deals, and and, and that's good. But more, far more of us have asked for a trial than they expect. And so that both the judges and the district attorney are upset with us. We're we're upsetting the apple cart. We're not doing what we're supposed to do, and we're not doing what, to their minds, is common sense. You know, they're they're usually offering plea deals that won't involve jail time, but do involve having a permanent order of protection is, issued against you. And and these things do have real life consequences. Um, people who have traveled internationally who have the orders of protection from our group, um, the order of protection is entered into the computer system so that when, when you go, um, in, when, when you go into another country or return to the United States, um, the fact that you have people have gotten pulled aside and held for hours and questioned, you know, do you have family problems? Are you, um, what's, you know, what, are you a dangerous person? And and so, like, as a professor at Nazareth College, I, I with this order of protection, I could never go on an international trip where I'm like the chaperone for students. Because I mean, what's it going to do to Nazareth to have the professor gets pulled pulled over for questioning for hours and uh, you know things like that? So, so your freedom to travel is is hurt. Also, of course. Um, if I go back to the base, and if I, um, the, the way the order was originally written, if I go back to the base, um, I can be charged with with violating the order of protection, which is basically contempt of court, and can face up to seven years in prison for returning to the base. So, I, I mean, most of us. We're really outraged at, at, at getting this. I mean, because we had all thought of orders of protection is is a you know criminal justice remedy that that's very necessary and appropriate for domestic violence. That's what they were designed for, and that's what I think most white middle class American citizens think that orders of protection are about: is protecting victims, of, protecting women and children mostly, who are victims of domestic violence and. You know, we have no problem with that, okay? But when they start, when it starts being used to protect an air base and to protect, you know, to protect, I've never met Colonel Greg Zemmel. Um, he's, um, I did see him finally once in court um, where, for somebody else's trial, where he testified that he's never met any of us, he has no fear of us, we've never threatened him. And yet he requested this order of protection to protect his base, and and so the order of protection is really to prevent dissent, dissenters from coming back to the base. Okay, now. And, and this wording is 
supposed to indicate that, even though it says this particular man, Greg Simmel, you've never seen him, never met him, would not approach him. How does this translate into the base? Well, the one the one place where it checks stay away from the place of employment of Greg A. Simmel, because he's employed oh. at the base. So, but the judge also very kindly wants me to refrain from assaulting him or sexually assaulting him, <laughs> raping him, strangling him. Um, <coughs> In criminal mischief. All, yeah, all, all, all of this stuff. Um, I have violated the order once because I'm supposed to refrain from communicating by any other contact, by, by email, and, and um, a couple months ago, Colonel Zemmel was on on one of those uh, email chat things where you could send in messages. So I did send him a message, which technically is violating uh, the order of protection, but they haven't they haven't charged me with that. But, but I mean, when, when you can't even participate, you know, like in an email chat thing without fearing that I, they could, I could go away to prison for seven months for that. Okay. Now, we were, we were pretty outraged and we've been protesting this quite a bit. We've appealed it. One appeal has been successful in, in a limited sense, which, um, which I'll talk about. Um, one, Dan Finley got a habeas corpus appeal, um, and Judge Brunetti of the State Supreme Court um, ruled that the, the order of protection was was illegitimate, um, first because it was vague, because the order never says how far away we have to stay. So it, 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 most orders of protection will give a specific distance you have to stay away. But even more importantly, um, and, 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 and this, is, this is the part where it, I think it gets interesting. We, I had thought that orders of protection were for domestic violence. In New York State, um, that is the case in criminal procedure law section 530.12 uh, allows for domestic order of protection. But in 1981, the legislature added section 530.13, um, which allows for orders of protection anytime a criminal action is pending. So 530.12 orders are domestic violence, but there's this whole other category, 530.13, which can go for any any type of criminal action. And one of the things that we've discovered that, that I hadn't known, and it's one of the reasons why doing civil disobedience I think is really important if you're you know, involved in political action, um, the, the district attorney and the judges were just, I think, genuinely befuddled that we were so angry about this. I mean, I refused, as you can see, I refused to sign. I, I told Judge Jokel, the first who ordered, issued my first order of protection, you know, I, I, I'm not, I, you know, I'm not going to, I'm not going to participate in a farce like this. And he got really angry at me. And, and, and the DAs got angry. And the reason they got angry, I think, is because orders of protection under 530.13 have become so routine. They do it for almost everything. One, one of, we had a meeting with one of the DAs, to, uh, or several of the DAs, because they wanted us to stop. And they couldn't understand. They said, we're totally misrepresenting what's happening with these orders of protection, which we weren't. Um, and they said, we issue orders of protection for shoplifting. Um, that and, and then I, I started as a sociologist trying to find out, well, how often do they issue these 530.13 orders of protection? And there's no record. I, I talked to the clerk of the Monroe County Court, and I, I called up in, in my position as professor of sociology at Azar College. I didn't mention that I you know, had an order of protection out against me. And you know, it just said, I want to do some research. And, he's, and he said, well, I don't, I don't think we got that. I'll have to get back to you. And call, call back and a few weeks later, and, and they don't have to report. So nobody knows how often they're issuing these orders of protection. I suspect that it, you know, that, that it's really often, and, and it's, it's, in theory, they're supposed to be issued only for people who are eyewitnesses or victims. 
and but in this case, uh, Colonel Zemmel and Colonel Evans, who's the other one who's at requested orders of protection, are, are were not eyewitnesses. They they may have been there, but they were not close enough to where the action was, so to speak. They were behind the okay. gate to, to issue any of this. Were you the only one that refused to sign? Were there others? No, no, a lot of a lot of people refused to sign. Um, so <coughs> I, I think, like I said, it's been kind of a, a through the looking glass experience because um, you know not much is written about what's being done with orders of protection, and I mean certainly, and, 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 and it's very the judge has very broad discretion about when to issue them, which which I think is really important in domestic violence cases and in general in cases involving violence, but when. You know, when they're issuing orders of protection for shoplifting, I mean, maybe, go ahead. They have the records of the other one, 12, you know, for domestic violence? I have, no. They, don't they have you know, they have, they report, you know, they report on convictions. Um, this isn't really a sentence. So, especially these temporary orders of protection be, can be issued before you're convicted of any crime, as you know. So they don't have to... As near as I can tell, and I, um, if I get a sabbatical, I'll, uh, right, rather than being just permanently uh, fired for uh, going to prison or whatever, uh, I think it might be something I want to look into because it, it just seems like this is one more element of criminalizing the poor. Maybe uh, you know certainly less than you know the, the mass incarceration project. But it's, it's kind of part of that increasing surveillance over people um, because, you know, if you've got the order of protection on you, that's going to pop up anytime you go, go across uh, international boundaries. Um, what, what about the right to peacefully assemble? Well, what has happened, uh, the original order of protection, The original order of protection um, didn't basically made no provision for peaceful assembly for us. That um, and the second order that was issued um, was after the Judge Brunetti decision, and the one thing that Judge Gideon did was to add some language that said that basically says that we are allowed to participate in a legally permitted demonstration at the base. So if, if we get a permit to go there, we're allowed to be there as long as we stay within the designated area that is allowed for a demonstration. In other words, you can't go, if you go one step outside that designated area, we can be charged with arresting it. Uh, with violating the order of protection. So far, um, there are about half a dozen people who have uh, violated the order, have been charged with violating the order of protection. Uh, Marianne Grady Flores, who's a grandmother from uh, Ithaca, a wonderful person um, I've known for years, um, was convicted um, about six months ago and uh, violated the order of protection and sentenced to a year in jail. Um, not totally nonviolent. She's currently out pending appeal. Um, Mark Coville, who's a Catholic worker from New Haven, Connecticut, um, just last month uh, was convicted of five charges, including violating the order of protection, um, obstruction of governmental administration, and, and three violations. He's he's going to be sentenced on December fifth, and he's facing uh, over two years in jail. Um, and, and Judge Jokel, the other judge, who, who, who was his judge, told him before trial, if you're convicted, you're going to get the max. And what's the max? Uh, two, year, two years and 45 days. And, and which I, I think that in itself, it, there, there's been numerous cases, I think, of judicial misconduct. Uh, in, in, in these trials, some of which were pretty amazing. Uh, 
Jack, um, like his name, Jack Gilroy, uh, is currently serving a three-month sentence. Uh, he, he was arrested with Sandy and, and myself, the first, uh, well, the first person to go to trial and be convicted from our from our group. Um, so he's he's currently doing doing three months in Jamesville Penitentiary. Um, he, although he, he never violated his order of protection, so he's just serving time for the other charges. So, so they, uh, it, what's been happening with this has been very erratic. I mean, some people have gotten acquitted, others have gotten convicted and sentenced to sentenced to big time. Um, when we first started, you know, bail might be a few hundred dollars or. Or actually, I, I was the first time I was arrested. I was able to argue with Judge Jokel and uh, be released on my own recognizance. After which everybody was, and then they started issuing thousand dollar bail, two thousand dollar bail. Um, at in the July, not the July action. Um, yeah, no, in, in in the July action, two people who. Had violated their order of protection were uh, issued ten thousand dollar bail by the judge for non -violent. One of them was uh, Martha Hennessy, the the granddaughter of Dorothy Day, um, and they finally arranged a for a bail hearing before another judge who reduced the bail their bail from ten thousand dollars to a hundred bucks, which was a nice slap in the face to Judge Jungle, um, but. Um, so it, 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 I don't know if I've been too coherent about this, but um, I, I, you know, I think it's another it's another avenue into to looking at how the criminal justice system is operating, and, and there's there's no way there's probably no better way of investigating the criminal justice system by experiencing it yourself, but it, and that can be kind of painful. Um, but it's also, I think, a good it has a good lesson for civil disobedience, which is you know kind of the old principles of Gandhi and Martin Luther King of fill up the jails, overwhelm the system. Um, well, we're doing that. We're you know, not filling the jails exactly, but we are overwhelming this one tiny court system, and. Um, it will be interesting to see where where it goes because because they've been they've been getting harder and harder in their penalties um, under the assumption that this was going to make us go away and it slowed us down a little bit but there's you know still people going and getting arrested and facing down the system and I think everybody is getting increasingly frustrated. I mean, uh, Judge Gideon a couple of trials ago says, this has got to stop. And, and, and we, we have told him that, you're right, this has got to stop. But by this, we mean the killings by drones. And, you know, we're not, and, and, and I think they might finally be getting the message that, you know, we're not going to go away until, until the drones go away. Um, and it, it's it, it's created a lot of a lot of tension, um, but you know the, whatever we've suffered, number one is is minimal compared to the victims of the drones. The, you know, little little kids who have been killed or maimed for life. Um, it, you know, we we have one of our other tactics is. And we've created a people's order of protection, asking the judge to uh, the judge and the district attorney to issue an order of protection for the people of Afghanistan against uh, the against the drone operators at Hancock for no illegal assaults, no no assaults, no illegal touching with your Hellfire missiles, um, and and actually we did uh, just at the beginning of the school year in in August. Late August, we had a, a meeting with the district attorney. It was again really funny. The uh, the district, the assistant district attorney, who's in charge of these prosecutions, um, 
went to law school with uh, a lawyer from DC who is um, the assisting counsel for one of the defendants and they happened to meet at a reunion in the swimming pool and started talking and found out they were on different sides and, and, and they uh, arranged this meeting because the DA is kind of desperate to get us to stop. And, and so we finally, they, they did arrange a meeting of, of several of us with um, several of the this DA's personnel and, and this lawyer, Mark Goldstone. Um, and I think it was good, because they even granted us immunity that they wouldn't prosecute us for anything, anything that we said in the meeting um, or use that as evidence against us. But they, uh, it was clear that they just wanted us to stop. And, and we, we also were very clear, you know, you know, if this is costing you too much, all you have to do is drop the charges. That's totally up to you. You know, I mean, we don't have to promise to do anything. If you want this to stop, the ball's in your court, friends. You know, you can drop the charges. You, you know, you don't have to do a plea deal. It's totally within your, within your charge. But they, you know, they, uh, they didn't want to do that. So we, we, I think we had a good dialogue and I think kind of came to understand each other a little bit more. But, um, you know, we, well, we didn't go in expecting that there would be any agreement because, But anyway, so I, I don't know. How has Nazareth responded to this? Has, your, has the college been supportive, or has the faculty been? Do you want me to say their name on tape? I don't. What? Edit that out. I can edit the name out. I don't know. Oh no, you can say yeah. You can say the name on. I mean, um, well, I mean, the faculty actually last year voted me. I, I tied for distinguished colleague of the year, um, which was really kind of yeah, which was kind of kind of nice because uh, you know if I do end up getting a year we'll have to uh, that would interfere with my teaching responsibilities and I have not yet begun uh, Nazareth in the past has been very supportive of me I uh, I was awarded tenure while I was a guest at the Federal Bureau of Prisons uh, for uh, <laughs> and, and I mean you know you know the the best reason for revoking tenure is moral turpitude, which is usually defined as being in prison. But uh, I, I was uh, I was a guest of the Federal Bureau of Prisons for protesting the first Gulf War while while I was undergoing tenure review, and they gave it to me. So they, in that sense, they're kind of kind of stuck with me. <laughs> um, but but in the past, Nazareth has been has been really you know very very supportive of me. Um, so we'll see. It's, we'll see what happens. Let's hope this that time. continues. Yeah. Well, it, I, I have a lot of support within the faculty. I think so. We'll, so we hope it will continue. We'll see. So do you guys want to sort of tie? Like, I, I sort of lumped you both together. Uh, I apologize for the noise, by the way. We had a birthday party scheduled for tonight as well, and we didn't know that it was going to be a little hair pulling. <laughs> wow, going on. Um, but, I mean, you both talked about sort of different facets of the criminal justice system, and I'm wondering if, and you've kind of made cases, but I don't know, is there more of a tie-in between these things and society at large, and the prison industrial complex? Well, I, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, the prison industrial I'd maybe call it the prison industrial military complex because it's all you know it, it's all tied together um, I think it's its methods of control are just expanding and getting um, getting more and more in violation of, of what we used to think of as the basic rights of Americans um, there's, there's a fairly new book out called On the Run by Alice Goffman, who actually was the daughter of the famous sociologist Irving Goffman, uh, who hung out for about six or seven years with, um, with, with mostly young male African Americans in, uh, in Philadelphia, in, 
in one of the areas, kind of, kind of around uh, Penn, where she was going, and and, and talk, talks about the lives of of young African Americans who were always dodging the criminal justice system, where some some folks, you know, were homeless because they couldn't afford to have a fixed location where the criminal justice system could could keep tabs on them. So they were sleeping in cars and, and things like that. And and just does, does a real good job of showing how it's not, not only not only the mass incarceration, but the mass surveillance under, you know, and the expansion of um, probation and parole um, and and the intrusive ways in which that moves into people's lives and, and breaks up families and you know turns families against each other and makes you know makes people afraid to visit their families. Um, I think just all of this point points to the um, just the the undermining of the the very basic sense of what democracy should be as 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 through the fear of crime and through the fear of terrorism um, we come to accept more and more repressive both tactics of violence and tactics of surveillance and I mean drones are a perfect example of that I mean they're used for both violence and and for surveillance um, and, and, and so in, in, in many ways, although it seems like there's many different struggles, the, you know, the Civic Center garage, uh, drones, uh, orders of protection, I think it's all about how our system is marginalizing, I mean, sometimes to the point of killing um, people on, on the outside. On the outside of society, and I, I mean, so I, I, I'd say all of it. We haven't mentioned Ferguson, but it's all, you know. I, I think the ties to that are, are pretty obvious too. And I see that the laws that um, protect the system, not the people. And I remember um, when I was, uh, being at the welfare office some years ago, and they had a whole, they had a whole supply of books and. The uh, the uh, title of the books were um, on welfare laws, welfare laws, and my thought was, all these welfare rules and laws and policies are to protect the system, not the person, not the welfare recipient, not the people who go to welfare to be helped. It's more to protect the system, which I see happening in your case too, you know. Um, and it's always like the system stands supreme and oppresses the people and really buries them, as far as I'm concerned, deeper and deeper into poverty. Uh, you know, where they seem like they have no rights and all their rights are gone or lost. Uh, the other question you asked about why they were taking their case of trial, um, we're intending to do that here too, mm -hmm. because having the trial brings the issues out. Yes. Yeah, and, yeah, and we want uh, we want that to get out there. Good. So yeah, yeah. It, it occurs to me when you say. <coughs> Well, I'm not sure how to frame this question, but if we ask why do these things go on, and we could say, well, all right, what happened in Ferguson was far away. It was a black person that got shot. It's way down there in the south. It doesn't matter to me. And we don't realize that there could be any number of things or factors that could propel any of us to being in a situation such as that where you know, there were so many days when we didn't care, but now, for whatever circumstance happened, I can't think of a hypothetical one, but now each of us are in a circumstance like that where there have been rules or laws or whatever you want to call these things put in place, like you're caught in the snare and you didn't even know the snare was there. That could be, yeah, I mean. I mean, and in, in many ways, we are, you know, those of us who are white are protected by our white skins uh, from that, but to a large extent, but it, it doesn't mean that, uh, that, it can't, that we can't cross that line and become part of that system. It's not, you know, the white skin is, uh, it, 
is not a foolproof inoculation. And, and I mean, I, I've always felt that because I know that because I'm white and male and middle class, that this criminal justice system in particular is going to treat me with kid gloves compared to what it's going to do to an African American male. Um, that that gives me more responsibility to to risk civil resistance and civil disobedience um, because because it's not going to carry as as heavy uh, heavy a penalty for me. Um, but as it is, I mean, I'm a, I'm a wimp. I, I I only do you know I only do one court case at a time. So I didn't join I didn't join Grace and Tom and Ryan uh, last week because I'm still worrying about whether I'm going to get a year for you know when I go on trial in June. And and, and actually that that's a real weakness because you know it'll be almost two and a half years between when I was arrested and when I when this trial actually goes which has kind of kept me out of resistance for and over I two years. Which that when, the, when I was arrested, uh, when we were protesting, the police were pretty clear, decent. Uh, when they started to arrest us, they got really mean. And they, uh, definitely, you know, we were violating what they thought were the laws. When we were going to the jail, the police were very nice to me and to uh, the men that were there. I think because we were white. If we were black and we were, you know, the youth on the streets, we would have been treated roughly. Yes. But we were treated, I mean, the police officer said to me, are you okay? And I thought, yeah, I'm okay, you know, do, do the handcuffs hurt? No, they don't hurt. But can you imagine a black person or a poor person being arrested and a police officer saying that to them? When we know, basically, you, you, you know what we've read, you know, in the papers, how some of the blacks on the streets had been treated when they were arrested, the man in the wheelchair, you know. So I think a skin color makes a big difference. Uh, it shouldn't, but it does. Uh, and that's all I can think of when they asked me how I was feeling was would they have said that to a black person? Mm -hmm. And I doubt it very much, you know. I was in agreement with the Civic Center garage being closed because I don't think the garage is a shelter, okay? Right. Uh, I've been told frequently that a lot of the people <coughs> who sleep, who have slept in the subway, who are on the grass outside the Amtrak station, such like that, these are people that have a lot of personal problems, alcohol, drug, mental problems, and so forth. They don't easily follow rules. If they went to the open mission shelter, they wouldn't be allowed to stay there because of their behaviors. It seems to me what you're trying to do to find a building is the right approach. And I don't totally understand from this meeting tonight what the zoning troubles are you and the other people you work with, like someone from St. Joe's Hospitality, right? Why a place cannot be found? Well, no one is saying that this, uh, this is what Parking Center is, is the best place for the homeless. Right. Uh, they've been going there for years because right. first of all, it's warm. It's warm yeah. there. And people have, people have been going there to help them. They've been bringing food, socks, blankets. And some of the homeless wanted to be alone, and some wanted to be with groups. Mm -hmm. And so because of the expansiveness of the, of the garage, people could do that. They could be alone or they could join a group. Uh, but mostly it was warm, so you can't blame them for going there. Uh, what we're saying is, uh, let's get a building that's close, you know, close, well, close enough to the garage. You know, what I mean by that is that he has a space within where yeah. they can come to, and we can work with them. Now, if a person, many of them, as we said, have mental issues. Yeah. Now, people with mental issues, you're not going to deal with them the way you would deal with people who, you know, don't have those mental issues, right. and you really sometimes can't reach them. But we have that in the House of Mercy. Many of our homeless have mental issues, but we have to give them time. Um, they, they'll be there as long as they need to be until we can get them into an apartment or get, get them into a housing first. Uh, who knows what's going on in the mind of a, a person who has mental problems. I, it's very hard to 
understand them and know why they're doing what they do. But they do need time, they need extra care, they need, they need um, extra protection too. Um, but to say that because you know they, they uh, have these mental issues should not be a reason for keeping them on the streets. It takes time. We had a, we had a young man that stayed with us for over a year. And um, he said to us, before he left, he was there for Christmas and during the year, and he said, thank you for letting me stay here for the whole year. Now, we would be criticized for keeping him for the whole year. But he said before he left, he said, thank you for letting me stay here. But I saw all the giving at the House of Mercy. I came to realize how selfish I was. And that for him was a great lesson because he learned something about himself. So we gave him that time to come to grips with himself. And so people who are, and, and about, about six months later, he came to the door and he handed me an envelope, walked away, and I opened up the envelope, it was $1,000. He had won a settlement, he came back and gave us the money. And a year later he sent us another $1,000 because he was grateful for the time. We, we have to, with the trust of people who have mental problems, uh, there was the, the person that was on the bench after the night the garage closed, who was sleeping on the bench, and this person would walk around like a zombie. He didn't know, and I saw him in the garage. He would just walk over to us when we brought food and things for them, and then he'd walk away and go to his private place. Well, it, you're not going to reach a person like that. Not unless you give him plenty of time and you win his trust, and that takes time. So, you know, that's what we need. If we have a place for them, we can give them that kind of time. Yeah. But you need a lot of understanding when it comes to working with homeless, with um, people who are mentally ill. And also, you know, we, we have difficulty ourselves getting the mental health system, um, persons to work with us. We held a meeting, we called in, you know, the uh, county mental health department we called in police who work with mentally ill and we were called in other groups and we had a meeting and with several meetings and because we needed help with our people that we have that are mentally ill the upshot of it all was keep on doing what you're doing you're doing very well <laughs> so here we try to get help <clears throat> and they're telling us we're doing fine so to try to even to try to get the help that we need to work with our people is very difficult you know so you know, but to leave them out in the streets is not the right answer. No. Uh, they need time. And also, when you get some into into a housing force or into apartments, you have to continue working with them. Because some of them can't adjust quickly to an apartment or living, you know, living in, in an apartment or in, in, a, in a rented room. They're not used to it. I mean, if you've been homeless for years, sometimes for some of them it's going to take time for them to learn and adjust to living in an apartment um, or in a, in a rental room. They need time, a lot of time, and we, and we need more people to help us work with them. We don't need to be judging them. We need to be helping them to get on their feet. Some people will remain homeless probably for most of their lives. There are some that are like that. Uh, they will be hard to reach, but it doesn't mean you leave them outside in the cold. It, it seems to me that um, talking about the mental health system is the same coin as talking about the homelessness in Rochester is talking about you know uh, the criminalization of poverty because in Monroe County and elsewhere, I mean from what I've heard, mental health services that are supposed to be governed and run by the state in this county have been basically moved to Buffalo, oh. moved to Albany. They're, they're, they've closed Rochester Psych Center. You know, they, they took places where people that, you know, maybe it wasn't the best care, maybe it wasn't. Right. They, they, took, they took specialized people right. out of the jobs, and then they, they pushed people to the curb, and in turn, those people end up in, in jail. So, I mean, do you, do you have any thoughts well, on when the Rochester Psychiatric When the Rochester Psychiatric Hospital closed in the 70s, when it did close, um, they were they didn't they were not society was not prepared for them. They were put out in the streets. They were supposed to be helped by agencies and they were not helped. And they remained on the streets. Now today we have their offspring, we have their children, their children's children who are out there, still out there, not being helped. So to send them out there, there are no 
they, they just left them out there. You, you're free, go out there in the streets. They couldn't survive on the streets. I mean, they couldn't handle the street life. Um, and if they're mentally ill, they're going to act out on the streets. And what is the solution as far as the system is concerned? Arrest them. But arresting them is not the answer. They need to be worked with, and it takes time, and it can be done. But it depends on how serious we take that issue and how much we really want to help the people who desperately need our help. And you know, it's almost like the harder it is to work with the people, the more the system deserts them, leaves them alone, let them, in, let them stay out there. But if they do something the system doesn't like, then arrest, arrest them. They're in jail or they're in prison. And as I said, when I was in jail, I met some of our own people who have mental issues. That was not the place for them. Uh, that's what continues to happen. But I don't know if your question was answered. Oh. Yeah. yeah, well, I'll be interested in following, if I can, your group trying to find a house for the homeless. Right. And it sounds like so far you're not meeting with success. Right? No, because the system is operating against us. The powers that be are fighting against us. They're resisting. Uh, they're resisting the help that we need. They will not help us. And it seems like, and it seems like, the more harder we try to get them to listen to us and to work with us, you know, the more adamant they become in not wanting to help us. You know, which is wrong. Which is criminal, as far as we're concerned. But we're not going to give up. We can't give up on our people. I mean, if we give up, then what's going to happen to them? You know, I did say to at the county ledge the other night, I did tell the um, legislators at the public forum, I said, if one homeless person freezes to death this winter, they will be held responsible. And it can happen. And I don't think Monroe County would want to be held responsible for one or two or three or four deaths of homeless freezing to death. We, we have a responsibility here. And all of us should become involved in it, do what we can to make this happen for the homeless, to make this place happen for the homeless. But it means going after the powers that be, going after Maggie Brooks, going after Bobby Warren, going after the legislators. Um, and you know, pushing them to take care of the homeless that they are not taking care of. They are helping some, but they're not taking care of all. We're saying all of them, every single homeless person, should be helped. In Monroe County and the, and, the, and the city have a responsibility, legal responsibility and a moral responsibility. Well, and right now, uh, they. The fact is that for, for over the last decade, um, 20, at least 25% of the emergency placements that Department of Human Services have made have been to welfare hotels, mostly the Hotel Cadillac, yeah. which, mean, which brings, I, I mean, their own statistics bring the lie to their claim that they provide adequate services for more than a decade, they've had they haven't had enough room in legitimate shelters to house 25 percent of the people that you know, or more than 75 percent of the people that come. So clearly, whatever the county says, it is not providing enough shelter and. The city's role in the city doesn't have the same legal responsibility, according to the Constitution, that the county does to care for the needy. But the city's role in this is the city code, which prohibits homeless shelters in the place where they are most needed, which is the center city of Rochester. It, they're against. It's against the law to set up a new homeless shelter there. So what are the boundaries when you say center of city? I mean, I've lived here about 50 years. What streets are you talking about? Well, 
the center city is definitely within the inner loop, but it includes some some areas, and I don't have the exact map, but they, they include some areas that are some blocks outside of the inner loop. But you see so, those center city signs, don't you, those center city signs? Well, yes. those are the boundaries of uh, center city, and, and it encompasses downtown mostly, oh. just a little bit out of downtown. But the, those center city signs is what you want to look for if you want to find out what is center city. Mm -hmm. And the other thing I want to say is that you know, people are thinking that homeless people are drunk and, you know, they're on drugs and, and that kind of thing. But we know that addictions are very hard to change. Very hard. And we have uh, one person at the House of Mercy, we were sending him all over for his drug addiction. Out of town, in town, years, a year away. And he would go, go to all these pro rehab programs. And he kept doing it and doing it and he'd be away for a while, he'd come back and go away again. And the last time, he, I, I walked outside one day and he was there. And he had been gone for a long time and gone to rehab. And when I saw him, I said, hey, you're back. And he said, uh, I've come back home. He said, the House of Mercy is my home. You're my family. I'm never going to leave you again. But my thought when I saw him was, he came back to die. And sure enough, within the year, he had died. But he knew that we would take care of him in his death, as well as we try to take care of him in life. And I was at his deathbed, and uh, his family who was in Florida never came to see him, you know, totally abandoned. Um, but you know, they have to know that you care for them, they have to know that you love them, and accept them the way they are, and then try to work with them from where they are. We can't change people, you know, the change has to come from within themselves. But we can encourage them, we can help them, we can let them know we love them, we care for them, and with that kind of care, they will begin to respond. But if we have this attitude of, well, you're, you're drunk and you're a, a drug addict, you know, uh, when well, I'm not going to help you, they'll never change any of them. They'll tend to go where they're accepted, as they are, and, and they're loved and they're cared for, and they're given hope. Many of them are hopeless. At the House of Mercy, we try to let them know we love them and give them some hope that their lives can improve, that their lives can change. And, and it happens. We've seen miracles. You know, um, and we're criticized because, you know, like I said, they say, well, you know, people stay there forever. No, they don't stay there forever. Um, they'll stay there with us as long as they need to to get on their feet. But also, We'll help them not only in life, but even when they die, we'll take care of them at um, their funerals. We'll, we'll make sure they have dignified burials. So we accept them from birth to death. And, you know, we're there. And that's how I feel about the homeless. <laughs> you know, um, we can't give up on them. I mean, and it's one thing in the House of Mercy we won't do. We won't give up on anyone. If it takes a year to, well, it's one example. Uh, we had a person who was with us for 14 years. He could not get help any place because he did not have a birth certificate. When he was real young, he was thrown out of his house. Before he was a teen, he was thrown out of the house. And that, that caused a trauma, severe trauma, so that he forgot. He didn't remember his name. He didn't remember where he was born. So as we, we were trying to get him a birth certificate, but he didn't know where he was born. And because he didn't know where he was born, it was difficult to get the birth certificate. And yet without that birth certificate, he couldn't get any help. Uh, couldn't get welfare, couldn't get SSI, <coughs> could get nothing, nothing. Probably not even a job. You know, so we, we were working with him and uh, Asked him many questions, and on a hunch, uh, my staff member thought, well, was he ever arrested? Well, then he found out it was a minor, a minor thing. He was arrested, but it was very minor. But what that arrest told us was where he was from. Mm -hmm. And so we found out where he was from, and contact, you know, to the city. We got a birth certificate for him. Then he was able to get a social security card. And today, he's in his own apartment and as happy as can be. He, and he's got his real name. 
he had forgotten his real name. Today he knows his real name. And he is as happy as a lark. And I was driving downtown Main Street one day. I saw him. He was right there on Main Street. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, it takes time. It takes time to work with our people. We have to give them that kind of time. The system doesn't want to do it. They'd rather punish them you know, and you know, send them off rather than deal with their problems. Um, but we see many miracles. And if the heart is there, the concern is there, the compassion is there, people can be helped and they will be helped. But if there's an I don't care attitude, they're not going to respond to an I don't care attitude. But they will respond to, I do care. Yeah. Any last uh, last questions? It's about 9 11, so we can wrap up here. Do you guys have any last thoughts or burning statements you want to make before? I just want to say that uh, if there's anything people can do to help us find a building or help us to get to the authorities to help change their minds, we can use that kind of help. Uh, also, if we get a place, we're going to need help. Um, we're not going to leave them alone. We'll be there all night long with them, and we need to provide services for them. Uh, so if anyone can, knows anyone or can help us with that, uh, in that regard, that regard would be a great help to us. Yeah. Well, I, I would echo what Grace has to say. That, I mean, <sighs> I, I think we need to get people involved as much as much as we can. Um, it's not looking good for getting people off the streets before winter and, or finding a place. And, and we really need to get the county is not going to provide funding. The city is not going to change zoning laws unless there's a popular outcry. And, you know, and unless people are demanding it, it's obvious that that the leadership of the city and the leadership of the county doesn't really care uh, on these issues, and they're not going to care unless the people force them to care. That's 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 the only route we can go. Oh, Mary, um, there's a square that's not talking to Franny Grace from the Beach's house. The overall building that they have in front. Yeah. yeah. We, we, we did talk with them. Uh, first of all, there'd have to be a lot of work done to that building. So we had an offer of volunteer part time to help fix the building. Well, what they said too was that if they open up that other building for the street people, you know, they, uh, they're afraid that the people that they take care of in their center will complain. Exactly. Yeah. So. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, they just wasn't doing nothing with the yeah. We did. We did check that out. We checked out as many buildings as we could. Um, mm -hmm. But there was always something. But I think what what Harry was saying is right. We need the reason why we're we're trying to have publicity every week on this issue is so that more people will become involved and more people who who have contacts with with those in authority and power can move can help shake them so that we'll get the help that we need. Uh, basically, we need the money from the county for a building, and we need money from the county so we can staff the building. We can hire someone to take care of that building. Uh, Lovely Warren asked me if I would take the lead, you know, in this in this effort. And I said yes, but I need your help. Yet when I go for their help, I can't get it. Uh, so I mean, there's something wrong with that. We're willing to do our part, but will the city, the county, do their part? Um, and what they're saying is, no, we're happy with what we're doing. We're satisfied. And we're saying, you're not taking care of all of the homes. And all of them should be taken care of. Not just not just the ones that are easy to place, easy to work with. You know, it's going to take effort. It's going to take real hard work. And we have to be willing to do that. Uh, we're doing that in the House of Mercy, but we're asking the county and the city to help us. And I, it bothers me that the fact that people, the homeless are outside right now in the cold, that this does not bother the, those in power, those in authority. How do you sleep at night in a warm bed, in a warm house with food, knowing that there are homeless outside in the cold? It blows my mind. It blows my mind. You know, so 
I, so I, I can't rest with it, and I won't rest with it until something is done. Uh, and we're going to try everything we can. Either if it, if it means getting arrested again Monday, you know, uh, when we try to put up the tents. And we need tents, we need blankets, we need sleeping bags, because we'll use them in the shelters, you know, in the, in the building as well. Um, but we need to do something to aid the people who are still out there. And they're the ones right now the county does not care about. You know, it's it's this attitude of, if you don't do what I tell you to do, I'm not going to help you. Well, how do you tell a mental person what to do when he half hears what you're saying and half understands what you're saying, you know, and has, has been homeless for years? Uh, you know, it doesn't make sense. Uh, yeah, and the, the other thing I would, that I just have to add, which will not make me popular, um, we can't assume that the mental health system is, even if it's adequately funded, is going to provide the example. I have, over the years, I, the mental health system can, particularly the old mental hospital institutional structures, uh, has been very abusive. Uh, I, I've known, you know, I've been working with folks who are homeless since the 1970s, and, and I've known I've, I've known people who would rather die on the street than go back to the mental health system. And I can't say that that's an irrational choice, um, given, <coughs> given the stories that, that people have told me and, 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 the, and the evidence that exists for how people can be treated in, in mental institutions. So, so that, that, I've got to add that that's not an easy answer in itself. I'm, I, I'm always torn when, when I'm working with somebody about whether calling, calling the mental health system is going to help or hurt. Because I've seen, I've seen people who have been helped by the mental health system, and I've seen people who have been hurt very badly by the mental health system. I, I, I can't just absolve my conscience and say, oh, I, I turned that folk person over to the mental health system, therefore everything's going to be okay. There's not, well, not, we've had them come to the House of Mercy from the mental health system, and they'll say they don't know what to do with them. But see, they, they can come to the House of Mercy and meet the people we want them to meet with mental issues, but then they say, I don't know, there's nothing more we can do for them. They leave, but we're still left with the homeless, with the person with the mental condition. And we'll accept that person and keep that person until we can until we can help that person. And if we can't, then the person is going to stay with us because we're not going to put that person on the street. And many have died at the House of Mercy, not in the House of Mercy, but I mean with their conditions have died. And um, the next step for us is to make sure that they have dignified burials. And that's another issue we're fighting with the county. Because in, 19, uh, in 19, 2006, Maggie Brooks made an administrative decision to cut the funding for indigent burials. So today, the county gives 1250 to the funeral director for a burial for the for a, a funeral for the poor, which covers uh, the embalming and moving from the hospital to, to, the, to the funeral director to the funeral parlor and the funeral. But when it comes to the burial, and many of our people do not believe in cremation. If they want their loved one to be buried and not cremated, it costs almost three thousand dollars, and our poor do not have that kind of money. And that's another issue we're fighting with uh, with Maggie Brooks. She will not change that policy. And we have people have come to us crying and agonizing. Uh, this a woman whose twenty one year old son died suddenly came to us. She was told if she didn't come up with the three thousand dollars, she would have to cremate her son. And she came to us and said, "I can't burn my son." She, she was with, at the welfare office uh, for five minutes. Didn't understand anything they were saying. She was with us for six hours, and to end uh, from four o'clock until midnight, until ten. At ten o'clock, we finally reached the uh, funeral director, and he told her, "If you're not here, if you don't come in with the money." By 12 o'clock tomorrow, your son is going to be cremated. And you know what kind of things we have to do? What we, what we did in that situation? You do crazy things to help people because the system won't help. I said to my staff member, I said, get the truck. 
and go down to the funeral parlor, this was the next day, and get the body out. Now you know you can't do that. I called the family and I said, go to the funeral parlor, uh, they're going to cremate your son. He went to the funeral parlor. And the funeral director was so angry that he called the police, and the police sided with us. So he, it was new, dry new, and he had the body already in a cardboard box ready for cremation. My staff member took the truck, blocked one driveway, the family blocked the other driveway so he couldn't get the body out. He was very upset, but it gave my staff member time to call another funeral director and ask them if they would come and take the body and bury the, bury the son. And that, that funeral director, somebody we knew, and she did. And so this was on a Thursday, and on Saturday, the son was buried. But you have to do crazy things, because the system is so crazy, you know? To fight the system, it's really, what it is is always fighting the system, always fighting the system. And you have to find ways of going around the system or cutting through the system. And for many of our people, uh, they don't, they're not going to go through all the bureaucracy and the red tape, they don't know what to do. So what we do is absorb all that red tape and try to get them you know, through the system yeah. and get them the help that they need. Um, and it's a big job, but we'll do it. Okay. Thank, well, you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.